thanks very much to Guillaume and to Jeff for, and the other organizers of ICGI for offering me the opportunity to speak at this 30th anniversary meeting. And thank you uh, to all my colleagues for that wonderful set of tributes. Uh, I just wish I recognized the person they were a tribute to. Uh, so let me warn you about this talk that uh, the question mark is well-deserved. In fact, this, this talk will be uh, many more questions than answers. Uh, let me start with the let me start with the first of the questions in the talk, which was a question that arose in response to a talk that Jeff gave just about a year ago in the um, formal languages and neural networks discord meetings, uh, where he was presenting this benchmark ML reg test for machine learning of regular languages. And his conclusion there or observation there in the talk was that the classifiers that they tested, uh, if, if the regular language depended on counting modulo n, it was much more difficult for the systems they tested. I had just recently read um, the De La Tang et al. paper, Neural Networks in the Chomsky Hierarchy, uh, which was also um, quite new at that point. And they had made the point, they had tested parity, which is clearly counting mod two. And they had made the point that while recurrent neural networks could generalize perfectly, so you see that line at the top at 100% accuracy, uh, transformers had a lot of trouble with it. And that's that jumping purple line. Um, once you get past the lengths of the training sequence. So this disparity created um, a conflict for me. Which one was it? So yes, which is it? Uh, so in this talk, we'll ignore transformers, uh, possibly at our peril. Uh, as the De La Tang paper showed, even under good circumstances, transformers seem to have trouble with parity. There's a recent paper of Chang and Cholek that says transformers can represent parity, which was quite a, quite a feat in itself, but uh, lots of work seems to have shown that empirically learning it seems to be beyond them. So we'll stick to recurrent neural networks, uh, by which I mean Elman's simple recurrent networks, long short-term memory networks, gated recurrent units, and second order recurrent neur neural networks. So in, in trying to do experiments with this question, uh, what I came up with as the chief suspect in the discrepancy between the two claims about counting modulo n was the lengths of the training strings. So in the ML reg test paper, the lengths of the training strings are between 20 and 29. In the neural nets and Chomsky hierarchy paper, the lengths go from one to 40. And it seemed as I muddled around with experiments that short training strings seem crucial to the learning of parity. We'll get back to this topic a little bit later in the talk. Um, I, there, there's been, of course, a lot of work on the representation of regular languages, the expression of regular languages by recurrent neural networks. This is just a picture from Minsky's book, Computation, Finite and Infinite Machines in 1967, uh, where he gives a construction using about M times N neurons to recognize the language of an N state M symbol, deterministic finite automaton. So in this picture, the rows 
are the one hot encoded input symbols and the columns are the states. Each little circle is a neuron, a discrete threshold neuron, where the number gives the number of inputs that have to be on for the output to be on. And the two at the bottom are just to read out the output. Uh, so I won't be treating representation at all in this talk. I'm mostly interested in learning. And that means most of what I have to talk about will be empirical results, uh, which is unfamiliar territory for this old theoretician. Um, well, yeah, do we really need another recurrent neural net architecture? We seem to have a fair number of them. Um, what happened in my empirical studies was that I've, I came up with this simple second order recurrent network that seemed to be at least promise some more interpretability in its learning process. So let me describe it briefly to you. Uh, one of the inspirations was Rabin's um, probabilistic automata, which are finite state machines where the transition on each symbol is a probability distribution on the states. So that led to the probabilistic automaton neural network, which I would just call PAN. Uh, it's a second order recurrent neural network, dimension D. Each symbol has a row stochastic transition matrix. So this is the probabilities on states and symbols. There's a fixed start state as in Raven's machine. And in a slight difference, the uh, output is read out by a linear output layer for the acceptance or rejection. Uh, in a little more detail, we assume a finite alphabet of K symbols. Uh, D is the dimension of the state vectors. There's a tensor that is a collection of uh, matrices in effect uh, that are the transition weights, D by K by D. The transition for symbol I is Ti, which takes the weight matrix for symbol I and applies softmax to each row. So it's a D by D transition matrix where each row is a probability distribution on the components. And the state update is simply take the current state and the transition matrix for the current symbol and multiply them to get the next state. So very simple model. Um, and just to fix intuitions, let's talk about how you might represent uh, parity using a dimension two pan. Uh, we can think of the states one, zero, that's the, let's say the starting state in zero, one, the other state. Uh, and we have transition matrices on zero, uh, we just stay in the state, that is, it's the identity. And on one, we interchange the two coordinates, just swap the coordinates. Uh, it's not exactly representing parity because of the softmax. Uh, to get exactly zero and one, the weights would have to be minus infinity and plus infinity. So we're a little bit off, but it's pretty close. Um, let's look at this question of learning parity, uh, in this case, even parity. Um, and we've, we're taking a four-dimensional pan in this case. And what is shown in this graph is the graph of the values of the four components, each one coded by a different color for a particular input string, the string 1100130131101. And after the colon is the label of whether the string prefix at that point is accepted or rejected. One thing we note here is that of the four components, uh, blue, red, green, orange, only the, the green and orange after the beginning seem to uh, arrive at a a, non, a significantly non-zero value, uh, you can see the on the first one, the 
the prefix is rejected because the parity is odd and we have this green peak. On the second one, uh, the, string, the prefix is accepted because the parity of ones is now even. We have this orange peak. On the third one, we reject the prefix and then we have zeros where we continue to reject the prefix. And in general, the behavior is, is pretty state-like in the um, components graph. Uh, if we switch to dimension 20, same problem, same input string, same kind of display, uh, we can see that still only two components, in this case, the blue, I guess it's blue and, and um, olive components uh, attain significantly non-zero values. So the extra parameters didn't seem to, dis in the weight matrix, didn't seem to upset the state-likeness of the uh, learning. Now, I should note in this case, the training strings, there were short training strings. That is the lengths of the training strings were one to 25. Um, so this is uh, in line with the De La Tang results. Um, so why are we thinking about second order RNNs? That is RNNs where we have a matrix for each symbol. Well, first of all, all the cool kids are talking about tensors. So maybe we should keep up. Uh, there's a direct analogy to finite state machines in the sense that there's one transition matrix per symbol. So that was the hope of interpretability that we might be able to stare at the transition matrices and correlate them with the symbols. Uh, there's a lot of history actually of uh, two dimensional, I mean, sorry, second order RNNs uh, being studied mostly early in, in this process. And there's a very nice result, uh, a paper of Lee, Precup, and Rabousseau, which shows the equivalence of linear second order RNNs and weighted finite automata with vector inputs and gives a feasible learning algorithm, not, not a simple uh, stochastic gradient descent or anything like that, but a nice algorithm for learning both of them. Uh, and just as an aside, that gives us that the same idea of equipping weighted finite automata with vector inputs gives us the idea that we can have pans take vector inputs, though I haven't explored any of that. Um, so I hope you will accept the idea of second order RNNs, at least for the duration of this talk. Um, so what do I mean in this talk by feasible learning of a regular language by a recurrent neural network? Well, this isn't quite a formal definition and I'm not gonna present any theoretical results of mine because I don't have any in this topic, um, but here's the rough outline of a definition. We're given strings over a finite alphabet labeled by their membership in a regular language L. The goal is to find RNN weights that represent approximately membership in L. And the key thing here is by some variant of gradient descent. So in the empirical results I talk about, it's just the atom optimizer in PyTorch with reasonable probability. So probability as a function of the initialization of the network and any randomness in the training of the network. Uh, using feasible, and of course, being a theoretician, I tend to think polynomial at that point, uh, data and time. And those should be as a function of the measure of the tar target language, some measure, uh, not necessarily states, but some measure. Uh, this definition is underspecified as a definition because it doesn't say how the sample strings are generated, um, but we'll We'll finesse that question for a while. Um, so how hard is this problem? How hard is this feasible learning problem? Um, what do we know about it? Well, there's Gold's result uh, from 1978, which says if we're given a, a labeled sample of strings, 
so a set of finite set of strings labeled positive and negative, that to find the minimum consistent finite or DFA for that set of strings is NP hard. So that's a worst case result for a particular thing you might want to do. Uh, more recent result of Kearns concerns statistical queries. Uh, I won't go into the definition of statistical queries. It's kind of nice, um, but it's not important for this part of the talk. Uh, so what Kern showed in his paper was that it requires a non-polynomial number of statistical queries to learn the selected parity language. So the select, let me talk about what the selected parity language is. Uh, it's a language of strings of a fixed length n. And for each selected parity language, there's a subset of the positions that are relevant, shall we say, and then the question is, well, for this example, the question is, find the parity of the bits in the relevant positions and say whether it's even or odd. So in the example, n, the string length is five, and the selected positions are one, two, and four. The top track of states uh, record whether, or not, rather record the fact that that prefix is even, uh, in the selected positions and the bottom uh, record that it's odd in the selected positions. So we start out in even, uh, a one in a selected position simply swaps the two tracks. So it goes from even to odd or odd to even. All the zeros simply stay in the same track and the ones in the non-selected positions also stay in the same track. So it's clear that the selected parity so there are two to the n languages, depending on the number of selected bit, uh, relevant bits. Um, so to learn a, a DFA to represent selected parity nearly merely needs two n plus one states. And this result of Kearns said a non-polynomial number in n of statistical queries are necessary. This is an information theoretic result. So it doesn't depend on any unproven computational assumptions. Why do we care about statistical queries in this context? Well, most or a lot of variants of gradient descent can be implemented with statistical queries. That is, they, are, they depend on information that you could gather using statistical queries. So a lower bound on statistical queries gives us a lower bound on these variants of gradient descent. Um, let me do a short aside. This is a, a very interesting paper, uh, recent by Barak et al., uh, that considers the problem called k-sparse parity. Well, this is just their k-selected parity positions. We're thinking of k as a fixed constant now. And in that case, the statistical query lower bound is n to the big omega of k steps for say, st stochastic gradient descent. Uh, empirically in the paper, they exhibit some uh, neural net architectures that achieve n to the big O of k. Now this isn't for very large k, this is for k less than or equal to four. So, you know, take it with a grain of salt. They give a theoretical analysis showing this behavior for two layer, multi-layer perceptrons. And this hidden progress in their title uh, is the observation that though the error or the loss goes along fairly high and then drops very suddenly when the, when the model um, sort of converges to a correct answer or figures out the relevant bit positions in effect, uh, the error falls suddenly. But what they offer are other measures that change more gradually as as the learning progresses. Uh, it'd be interesting to apply that in this context. Anyway, that was an aside. Um, so we come to the main question, which is uh, RNNs can feasibly learn some regular languages, sometimes, at least empirically, 
And RNNs cannot feasibly learn all regular languages. That's provable. So what we'd like is a theory of feasible learning by RNNs in terms of properties of the regular languages that we're looking at. And of course, the training um, regimen. So I will, I haven't emphasized the training regimen um, and that's very important. Uh, so let's do a bit of history. Uh, it's not at all comprehensive or complete. Uh, if we look at the early attempts at having RNNs learn regular languages, they occurred in the late 80s and early 90s, listed are some of them here. Uh, most of the RNNs are second order RNNs in this case. And you'll see that there isn't a huge variety of languages that were considered. Uh, the Reber grammar, grammar parody, which we've already talked about, and the Tomita languages. And uh, the later papers proposed extraction methods for DFAs. So from a trained model, could you extract a DFA? So that's quite relevant to the TACER competition in connection with this meeting. Um, so let's take a closer look at these few languages that were used in this early work. Uh, this is an automaton characterizing the language used by Reber. Well, Arthur Reber was interested in implicit learning of grammatical structure by human subjects. So this was part of how he generated uh, problems to study that phenomenon, the phenomenon of implicit learning. So this, this automaton um, has two arrows out of every non-final state. So if we simply flip coins when we're in states, we can randomly generate examples in the language. So at the bottom of the slide are the strings of length six that this particular grammar generates. In one of his experiments, Reber asked the subjects to memorize strings and measured how well they did it. And he had two conditions. One is the strings were generated by this grammar from length six to eight, I think. And the other condition was random strings, which he attempted to match for information content. And not too surprisingly, um, the, the structured strings were easier to memorize in his experiment. Later on, he used the same uh, grammar to generate strings and test whether or not looking for a pattern helped people. So the subjects were instructed to try to memorize strings, and then they were tested both on the memorization and their guesses as to whether other strings followed were of the same type. Half, half the subjects were informed that there was an underlying pattern, half the subjects weren't. And it turned out if you told people there was a pattern, I guess they wasted time trying to find it. And they did worse at both the memorization and the recognition task. Um, so this was an argument that there was a separate process going on, an unconscious process of implicit learning. Anyway, this a variant of this uh, grammar, in fact, uh, not exactly this grammar, was used by Clearman's et al. in an attempt to see what simple recurrent networks, elements and elements networks could learn. Uh, and what they were doing was not recognition, but a um, language modeling task. So at each point, the model was supposed to predict the possible next symbols. And it was regarded as correct if it picked out the two that were actually possible from that state. And after something like 60,000 uh, examples, they got the model to learn perfectly. Uh, so that, that's the Reber grammar, in case you run across it. Um, 
More popular, perhaps, were the seven languages proposed by Masaru Tomita. Uh, he describes them in a tech report in, from CMU in 1982. The seven languages were uh, and samples of positive and negative strings were used by him in um, assessing the performance of a hill climbing method for learning uh, DFAs from given samples. So most of the languages are quite intelligible. So L1 and L2, strings of ones, strings of repetitions of one zero. L3 is a bit more complicated. We'll talk about it next slide. L4 is a strictly local language that requires the string not to contain the substring zero, zero, zero. L5 and 6 are interested in the behavior of zeros and ones, modulo 2 and 3. And L7 is a strictly piecewise language that of strings that don't contain the subsequence 1, 0, 1, 0. Um, and for these, the, the complete DFAs over 0, 1 to accept them range from 2 to 5 states. They're pretty small. Let's look at L3 a little more closely. This one's not quite as easy to give a natural language description of. Uh, what I've given on the slide is a regular expression for its complement. So if we look at the two states on the left, there's a transition on zero to the two states on the right. So there's sort of a first half and a second half. Uh, the machine only rejects if you end up in the third state or if you arrive at the third state and see a one. So the sync state is not shown in this diagram. In the regular expression, the zero there is that transition zero. So it's the first zero that has an odd number of ones to its left. And then the right part of the expression says, uh, you've arrived at three, you might uh, wander around and come back to three. And if you stop there or see a one, uh, it's rejected. So hopefully that's uh, intelligible now. What I'll do is use this language to um, demonstrate some of the techniques of looking at this learning process. So we take a dimension 10 pan and training strings uh, of lengths 2 to 21, so it's got short strings in it, uh, a thousand of them, and, and testing strings of a strictly disjoint set of lengths, 26 to 50, also a thousand, and they're equally uh, divided between positive and negative strings. The training is, well, I was kind of lazy about the training. You take a random draw from the training set, get one string, uh, compute the loss and do a weight update. And you do that, in this case, 25,000 times, taking random training strings at each point. Uh, in three trials of this, when I tried it, uh, the training accuracy and the testing accuracy both came out at 100%. Well, that's sort of, you know, it doesn't really tell us much. Can we get more insight into what's happening? Well, we can do the um, graph the components trick. In this case, uh, for historical reasons, A is zero and B is one. So as we look at a particular input string, uh, we see that the blue and purple components of the states, so just two of the 10, uh, represent remaining in the left two states that significant transition zero is the first A with uh, an orange transition associated with it. Um, and then it remains in the right two states in the orange and red uh, components. This particular string doesn't reach the sync state. Um, and we can look at it differently if we take a scatter plot of the final state vectors of the trained model. So after the model's been completely trained, uh, we can run all the training strings through the model and get a set of vectors, a thousand vectors. 
of dimension 10. Uh, well, I can't see very well in 10 dimensions. So we project it down to two dimensions. The, the projection for the horizontal dimension is along the normal to the separating hyperplane. So points that end up to the right of zero are accepted and points that end up to the left of zero are rejected. In this case, the points have been colored according to the states of the minimal accepting complete DFA. So for example, that gold color is the sink state. Uh, and we can see that the after full, being fully trained, the vectors of the final states for the training strings end up quite clustered. Uh, does this always happen? Well, here's another trial of the same um, learning process. Um, well, we don't quite get the same crisp state-like behavior. In fact, after that transition uh, zero in the, in the middle there, uh, individual components uh, don't represent states. It's um, non-zero values for several components. Well, are they really states? We can look at the scatter plot. Well, that's a lot less um, condensed. Uh, they look separate. Uh, one thing we can do is use a suggestion of Nikolenko at all and say, well, we have the state labels for these vectors. Uh, can we, how good can a linear classifier be trying to produce the state labels? And despite the fact that the projection looks like they overlap, um, we get linear classification with 100% accuracy for the state labels in this particular case. So that's another way to look at things. Um, we can also try extraction. If we extract a DFA, we get some sense of what the, the um, model is trying to do. In this case, we follow, uh, we assume the model's trained 100% accuracy on the training set. And we follow Vice et al to use L star with model answers to membership queries, but instead of uh, asking the model to answer equivalence queries, we simply use the training set. So if the proposed DFA agrees uh, with the labeling of the training set, we declare ourselves done. And what we get is a DFA consistent with the training set. And if it isn't, then we use the training string where the labels disagree as a counterexample to the equivalence query. And for this particular set of trials, the extracted DFA in this simple algorithm is um, the target DFA. Um, so shortly after, the flurry of work on extraction of DFAs from RNNs, uh, John Colin wrote a paper titled Fool's Gold, and he didn't mean iron pyrite, extracting finite state machines from recurrent network dynamics. Um, the quote is, this assumption of finite state behavior is dangerous. Uh, what seemed to be the motivating factor was the feeling that a lot of the results of researchers in um, dynamical systems were being ignored. And the arguments put forward in this paper seemed to be that, well, if you were unlucky, um, an RNN could exhibit chaotic behavior. And if you looked at it right, you could see it producing behavior that couldn't be described as finite state. Slightly later, there was a, an, a kind of response from Mike Casey. Uh, and the corollary from the paper says, a finite dimensional RNN can robustly perform only 
finite state machine computations. So this is uh, in direct contradiction of Cohen's claim. However, for his proof, Casey assumes that state components are in the closed interval zero one and uses compactness. So for example, LSTMs, which don't necessarily have state components in that interval and which we've seen can exhibit counter-like behavior uh, are not covered by Casey's result. One of the things that Casey proves for his model is that uh, the extraction algorithm of Giles et al. will correctly extract a DFA representing the behavior of the RNN provided the um, mesh is fine enough. That is the, the um, the epsilon at which you distinguish two states is small enough. Um, now we'll fast forward a bit, skipping over a number of years and talk a little bit about more recent empirical work. So there was a paper of Afsu, Shibata and Heinz that looked at recurrent neural networks, simple re recurrent networks and LSTMs learning six particular regular languages that were representative of strictly local languages and strictly piecewise languages. Um, there's the Weiss et al. results. They were focused on extraction, but they needed trained models and their trained models learned the Tomita languages and some random DFAs with five and 10 states and three and five symbols. And they looked at uh, GRUs and LSTMs. Nikolenko, Shaw et al. Um, considered random regular expressions in their automata. The DFAs had a maximum of 14 states. The regular expressions were over the digits zero through nine. Uh, that gets into an interesting question of how you generate the training sample. The De La Tong Luas paper, the Chomsky hierarchy and neural networks, looked at two regular languages, parity, which we've talked about, and the language of strings where the first symbol is equal to the last symbol. They look at S SRMs and LSTMs and a variety of other architectures. And the ML reg, reg test paper of Vanderpool Lambert et al. gives a corpus of 1800 regular languages. Uh, some of the DFAs are quite large, but the median is 11 states. And they look at learning, uh, the, the languages are organized very carefully by specific sub, sub regular classes. And they look at learning by simple recurrent networks, GRUs and LSTMs, also transformers. Um, now, out of this cornucopia of possibilities, I'm going to focus on the first and simplest of these um, languages, which is um, the strictly local language with parameter two considered by the Afsu, Shibata, and Heinz paper. So this is a language that can be recognized by a four state DFA. It's over a four letter alphabet. It's characterized by things that, that shouldn't happen. So any string over this alphabet that doesn't start with B, doesn't end with A, and doesn't contain either the substring AA or the substring BB is in the language. So let's look a tiny bit at the machine because we're gonna spend a lot of time with it. Um, the state four is the sync state, it's in cyan. So for example, if we start in the start state and see a B, we immediately go off to the sync state because it's not supposed to start with B. Of the other three states, state two represents the fact that I just read an A. So the incoming arrows are A. If there's an A there, we go off to the sync state because we would have 
seen AA as part of the string. Um, state one represents I just saw a B or I just started the string. The incoming arrows are Bs. And if we see another B, we go off to the sync state. And state three represents I just saw a C or a D. And states one and three are accepting, states two and four obviously are rejecting. Um, so what we'll do is we'll look at a movie, uh, quote unquote, that is a flip book of the learning process of a 10 dimensional pan learning this language SL2 at, stopped at specific numbers of iterations, that is weight updates. Uh, we note that the training strings are of lengths six through 25. So we don't, we don't let it see the short strings in the training sample. Uh, this is after, right after initialization, all of the strings map to vectors that are pretty much in the same place uh, as you would expect. Uh, so after 500 weight updates, what happens is some of the some of the strings that reach the um, sync state, that is the cyan strings. So these are again labeled as to their as to their state in the minimal DFA. Some of the strings that reach the the sync state, the cyan strings, have been correctly pushed over to the left and are shown as rejected. Some of them are still hanging out on the right. And it looks as though the, the CD state, that is the red dots, are drifting to the right to be accepted. It's not so clear about blue, the B. So now we'll move on a little faster. Um, so we're going by 500 weight updates. So we see still some sync state strings on the left and some movement on the right. And here for the first time we see uh, green, which is state one ends in A, but isn't necessarily done for yet. It is, hasn't, hasn't gone to the sync state. Uh, we see that on the left. Uh, because of the nature of the display, there are a thousand points shown here. So some of them are on top of others, uh, but at least at this point, we see that it's rejecting some strings that end in A. Um, and we keep moving. Pretty much all the CD states are doing pretty well, but the blue states are not so happy. They're separating more, uh, separating more. Looks like most of the sync state strings are generally moving left. Now they've moved left, but not quite far enough. And here, for the first time, we get 100% accuracy on the training strings. And if we let it run to 2,000 strings, we get extremely compact uh, clusters for the states, the two on the right accepting, the two on the left rejecting. Well, that's interesting, but we can also do a little more. That is, we can look at particular properties of the strings and what happens to them. So let's do the same movie again and see to see that this claim is true, that does not end with A is learned quite early. So does not end with A can be uh, in two states, can be in the sync state if there's been some other violation or could be in the green state, the A state, if there is no other violation and, and it's still possible to go on. So let's look at the movie again. Uh, here's the start. And what we've done here is colored the dots for strings ending in A in red and everything else in this gray. Um, so what happens? Well, all of a sudden, the red dots have moved left. In fact, if you extract a DFA from this model, trained it for 500 weight updates, 
i.e. not even seeing, well, seeing perhaps uh, every training string on average once. Um, the model will be uh, classify strings according to whether or not they end in A. Um, so then we continue. Uh, we see no red on the right. In fact, it's segregated out all the strings ending in A after 500 weight updates. And now some of the other sync state strings need to be shifted to the left. And finally, we get correct classification. Uh, we can look at another property. In this case, does not start with B and see that it, in contrast to does not end with A, is learned very late. So here's the start. Can't see any of the red yet. Um, red's on the right. Red's still on the right. We see the does not end in A shifting over to the left. Um, so as we move along, none of the red dots have moved left yet. And what happens is they finally straggle over to the left and we get correct classification of the training strings. So what's happening here? Uh, well, at this point, we can go back to the question of the lengths of training strings. So let's take the simple case of the regular language does not start with B. So this can be accepted by a three-state DFA that simply um, makes note of what the first symbol is and then stays in either an accepting state or a rejecting state after that. So it's a very simple regular language. It does have the property that you need to know, you need to know what's going on with the first symbol uh, in order to classify it properly. Uh, if we train on lengths one through 25 for this language, for 20,000 iterations with either dimension 80 or 10, we get train accuracy and test accuracy of 100%. So this language is successfully learned and generalized um, with 20,000 iterations. However, if we change the training sample, again, thousand strings, but it doesn't contain any of the strings of lengths one through five, and we run for 20,000 iterations. Well, it gets some, some distance on the training strings, but the testing strings remain at chance. So there are essentially no generalization. We see that the 80 dimensional pan can uh, do much better, that is gets up to 76% on the training sample, but still remains at chance on the testing sample. Well, what if we crank the number of iterations up by a factor of 10 to 200,000, uh, but still, with, withhold the short strings, the strings of lengths one through five. Uh, well, we improve the training accuracy in both cases. In fact, the training accuracy for dimension 80 goes all the way up to 100%. It's learned the labels of the training sample perfectly, but the performance on the test sample, that is strings of length 26 through 50, still remains at chance. So what's happening here? Well, in fact, um, we can compare these last two results, training for 200,000 iterations, and we can do something strange to the labels, that is take the same training strings and assign them random labels consistently so that if a training string appears twice, it gets the same label, but the labels are all random. And what happens, that's the last two rows of this table in red. What happens is very similar to the performance of learning without the short strings. That is the tra training accuracies are very close to the same. 
and the testing accuracy remains basically chance. So what we see here is that the dimension 80 pan can learn completely random labels for this training set um, and not generalize at all. So what's going on here? Well, this is a kind of picture of the computation of the pan on a string of length five, B, C, D, C, A. Uh, each layer represents the multiplication by the transition matrix for that symbol. So it color coded them. Uh, and it, this is what I've not shown is the connection of the transition matrices to the weight matrices. Each one connects to its weight matrix. But what this is a picture of the computation graph through which the loss needs to be propagated backwards from the right-hand side to the left-hand side in order to figure out what the weight updates are. Um, so what we can see is that a loss signal from the right might um, have to progress through an awful lot of edges to reach an edge on the left. And what happens when I explain this to people is most of them then say vanishing gradient. Um, so I tried to look into the literature of vanishing gradient and found not a lot that I could hang my hat on. Um, so something else is going on. I mean, the gradients get smaller, I've measured them. Uh, but something else is going on here because the language does not start with B, that is that property we saw is quite happily learned in the context of the strictly local language SL2. So we saw the does not start with B strings finally migrating over to the left to be rejected. So the more to the story seems to be that in the context of learning other parts of the SL2 language, some of these connections were attenuated or strengthened to the point where the error, the loss can be propagated to the left more effectively. Uh, I don't have a theory of this, though not for want of trying. Uh, one thing that this um, realization, um, shall we say, brings up is the question, what happens if we start with a simple regular language like SL2 and we pick out a percentage of the training strings and flip their labels? So what we'll be learning in effect is a regular language with exceptions. And the exceptions are supposed to be learned. Uh, what happens in that case? Do we get behavior like memorization where there's kind of no generalization or what? Uh, and what this graph is, is a picture of the results of experiments with dimension 10, those are the X's, and dimension 80, those are the dots, with different fractions of the uh, labels flipped. So the horizontal axis is the fraction of correct labels in the training sample. And the vertical axis is accuracy on the test set. Now the test set doesn't have its labels flipped. So accuracy on the test set is in effect a measure of how close is it to learning something like the correct SL2 language without the exceptions. And the dotted red line is the identity. And what we see here is that there is generalization that takes place. That is the exceptions don't cause the models to just go haywire they kind of generalized SL2. In fact, the dimension 10 does better than the dimension 80, presumably because it has less capacity to memorize 
If we look at the dimension 80, the effect of these exceptions seems to, on the correct generalization to SL2, seems to be just a kind of linear um, depression of accuracy, which is kind of strange. Um, we can look a little more at that phenomenon. And here is one of those models at dimension 80 looking at the scatter plot of, of training strings after just 7,000 iterations. So this is, you know, fairly early on in the learning of this, this language. This, so this is a language which is SL2 with about 14% of the labels flipped in the training set. And at this point, the model actually agrees perfectly with the correct SL2 labels and generalizes pretty well to 99.5% on testing. So what's happened here is a kind of early generalization. What we see is the kind of dominant signal of SL2 has been taken up by the model to the point where it's hypothesis at this point, and if you extract it, you just get SL2. The hypothesis at this point is SL2, but this is not correct for the training string. So further training requires it to move some of the strings around in order to reject the ones that um, whose labels have been flipped when we're on the right and accept the ones whose labels have been flipped and are on the left. So after uh, 100,000 iterations, dimension 80 achieves accuracy 100% on the training and is now at 81.7% on the testing set. And this is the scatter plot. So we can see that the um, strings, that the vectors for the strings that needed to be moved got moved. So there are cyan ones on the right and red and blue and on the left and like there are green ones on the right as well. So the um, the process seems to be generalization and then fix the generalization by uh, sort of patching up the exceptions, which is which was kind of stunning to me. This um, this is not just this one example. It happens a little more generally. Um, so I said questions. Um, here are questions, some more of them, uh, that have come up in this process that I can't answer. Um, the whole point of this talk is roughly to sprinkle a little bit of sand into your maws so that you will produce pearls. I have a great deal of confidence in this research community being able to make progress on these questions. Uh, if they haven't already, I mean, obviously, if I've missed papers, please let me know. Uh, but anyway, so if we're given a sample of strings labeled positively and negatively, if I give a pan a, or an, any RNN sufficiently large dimension and number of iterations, will I get something consistent with that labeling? So how about very simple classes of regular languages or very simple regular languages. We saw that Ns and As sorted out very quickly. Can we prove it? Can we prove that some appropriate variant of, of gradient descent will feasibly learn the class of the, the language Ns and A, as long as the dimension is sufficient and the sample is appropriate? Uh, I actually spent some time trying to prove this and kind of got most of a proof for length two strings over two letters, um, which was interesting because it pointed out a solution in, in that domain that I hadn't thought of, but I don't know how to prove this. Uh, if yes, for this, this question, what about definite regular languages? That is regular languages where there's some fixed constant so that the suffix, say k, the suffix of length k determines acceptance or rejection, or maybe other more ambitious subclasses. Another question that comes up is, if you're given that the learning program is some fixed 
gradient descent variant, uh, could we devise a training program that is a way of presenting examples over time that would cause the RNN to learn an arbitrary regular language? I experimented with this a little bit. So you pretend that the you pretend that the language is actually something simpler by modifying the sample. And then once it's actually got a pretty good bead on that simpler language, you provide uh, the actual examples so that it will move to the actual language. And I you know, can't prove anything and don't know anything general here. And I get back to the main question for the whole talk. Uh, can we find some theory of feasible learning by recurrent neural networks in terms of the properties of the regular languages and the training scheme. So obviously I've underemphasized the training scheme here, but it's a very important component. Uh, and I wanna say thank you for listening uh, and thank you for being researchers in this incredibly interesting field, which has uh, a lot of fascinating questions that you all will make progress on. Uh, I guess the point here is I haven't used up quite all my time. Oops, I have. Um, we, well, we also started late, so we'll still take a, a little bit of time for a couple of questions. Uh, thank you, Dana, for this, this uh, very, very nice talk. I think yeah, it's indeed very interesting to wonder what kind of languages can they learn, you know, going beyond just the expressiveness of those models, but also in, when we go back to learning, what can we learn with these uh, neural network models? And so that's very nice. So I don't know if we have uh, questions here. Yes, Francois. Uh, I, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me, uh, Donna? Yes, I can, thank you. Okay, thanks a lot for this very interesting talk. Um, at the end, in uh, your conclusion, you don't speak anymore about efficiency of learning, polynomial time. Is there something we can do? Or what is your point of view about that for a neural network? Uh, I think suitable definitions could be made. Um, what I offered was a kind of rough approximation uh, without, um, so, so presumably,